All right, uh, thank you. Um, as director of the University Press, I'm, I'm going to discuss um, the, the promises and pitfalls of open access on scholarly monographs, particularly in the humanities and social sciences, because that's, that's well, what I do. Um, and, and I do want to um, clarify the concept of value added, which is, is I think, vital. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I definitely want to emphasize the distinction between nonprofit publishers and, and commercial presses, because we get conflated. Okay. So, but, but before that, I have to start with a quote from Marx, which is appropriate, I think. Um, Outside of a dog, a book is a man's best friend. Inside of a dog, it's too dark to read. Um, that would be Groucho. Um, okay. Um, I, I speak for my, myself, but I, I know I speak for many of my colleagues at other university presses um, when I say that we share and embrace the central premises of open access. It may not appear so, at times, um, we also recognize the unprecedented opportunity that open access offers for the future of scholarly communication. Um, we believe that high quality scholarship has a value that transcends sales potential. We worry that market incentives can promote the publication of faddish, ephemeral scholarship with little or no enduring value for future generations. We believe that profit motives, again, at university presses, nonprofit university presses, we believe that profit motives are incompatible with the fundamental goals and purposes of scholarly communication. And finally, we believe that uh, access to scholarship should not be limited only to those individuals and institutions who can afford it. That's contrary to our mission. Uh, for example, on September 12th, 2001, there were only three books available in English on the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. All three of those books were published by small and mid-sized university presses, and even if they had sold out their entire print run, they would have still lost money. Okay, there's a distinction between commercial presses and university presses. I think we were very glad to have those books the day after 9-11. Okay, that's our mission. Um, again, the guiding principle behind these books, the publication of these books, which is a significant investment, uh, was not financial gain, but the, uh, the belief that scholarship has a value that transcends sales. And this is why we joke that university presses publish books before there's a market. <laughs> And we also like to say that university presses lose money wisely. Um, these justifications uh, have little impact in an era of tightening budgets and uh, demands to identify metrics of success and impact. The bottom line, as Kathy Davidson has written in her book, Crises and Opportunities, The Futures of Scholarly Publishing, the bottom line, and I quote, scholarly publishing isn't financially feasible as a business model. It never was, it was never intended to be, and it should not be. If scholarship paid, we wouldn't need university presses. Okay. University presses were invented to identify, improve, and disseminate scholarship to the broadest possible audience without regard for financial gain. Uh, our logic is that scholarship published in a void can have no influence. Yet, if it seems to me that university presses have such a profound and clear concert of interests with advocates of open access, why are we, uh, why is there so much conflict? Why, for example, are university presses suing university, uh, university libraries? Um, and, and, and in response to an article in the Chronicle of Education, 
Uh, the article was called Publishers Will Appeal E-Reserve's Decision That Favored Georgia State University. One of the comments, and I quote, I don't see publishers as greedy scoundrels. That's comforting. Um, but more as unimaginative conservatives clinging to an outmoded business model and trying to preserve the world as it once was based on core and often unexamined assumptions that are dead or dying. They are using the legal system to force their clients and customers to help them maintain that unrealistic view because many publishers are unwilling, unwilling to or incapable of adapting to the new world order. In that regard, they are no different than other businesses, past and present, that have been forced to ask themselves what business they are really in and how they can stay in that business when the world around them changes. Well, I... Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was very eloquent. Um, I, I, I couldn't disagree with it more profoundly. Um, you know, uh, in essence, recent books, articles, um, editorials, some advocates, and it's important for me to state here that not all advocates of open access, it is not a homogeneous group. We are talking about journals, we are talking about Books, we are, we're, it's not, it, they are not of a, a singular mind. So I'm, I'm not casting aspersions on every advocate of OA, but these people are out there. And uh, they're, they're um, so anyhow, we, we, we get, we, we have been criticized at university presses for what, and I quote, gatekeeping authority, um, which, some advocates claim um, intentionally limits the dissemination of scholarship in the pursuit of financial gain. They ask, you know, who are university presses to decide what scholarship gets published and which professors should get tenure and promotion? Why do we have that authority? Um, even, even the fundamental concept of peer review is now under attack. Um, and I agree that peer review is imperfect. Okay, um, it, uh, it's prone to turf wars, ideological differences, methodological disputes. It's an imperfect system. You, you can imagine the things I've seen in 18 years of peer review. Um, you know, that's why we joke, the, the, uh, the reason the battles are so bloody is because the stakes are so small. And, um, but uh, some, including uh, Kathleen Fitzgerald, uh, you know, the, uh, this is an actual book published by an actual university press that says university presses should become obsolete. Um, and, uh, you know, she has suggested that uh, the, everything should be published and it should be reviewed after publication, post-publication review. Um, you know, and that's, that's an interesting concept until you read the New York Times from August 25th, which had an article entitled, The Best Book Reviews Money Can Buy. And it describes an entrepreneur who started a website called gettingbookreviews.com, uh, who started earning $28,000 a month for writing positive reviews of his clients' books on Amazon.com and other online retailers. Okay. Uh, we've been told, I've been told that uh, University presses have become anachronistic and obsolete organizations more concerned with our own self-preservation uh, than with publishing, disseminating, and preserving scholarship for posterity. Oh, you're kidding me. I'm just getting warmed up. <laughs> oh, you're kidding me. Oh, no. Um, listen, University Press has... Um, of Kentucky has tried several experiments with open access and we're actively engaged in promoting open access. Uh, between September 1st and September 9th, 2011, I will try and keep this brief, I'm cutting it back. Um, we published a memoir by Bob Edwards, the famous journalist from Louisville, called A Voice in the Box. And we offered it to anyone who had a Nook, Kindle, or other um, you know, a reading device. We made it available for free download for seven days 
prior to the availability of the print edition. This made national news. Uh, Bob Edwards was promoting it on his, on his show daily. Uh, the, the, the notion of this university press offering a free book for download, picked, it was picked up LA Times, New York Times, Washington Post. We sold, or no, I'm sorry, 14,994 free copies were downloaded in seven days of Bob Edwards' memoir. Since that, the end of the, since that week, we've sold 618 Kindle editions. Now, did I devour our market? Did I decimate potential sales? Or was that good advertising? It's, it's tough to know because there's no control. Okay? Uh, we've sold 3,799 print copies, if you're curious. It was quite an experiment. I, I don't know if it was a success, <laughs> but, but it was... Um, Currently, Google has digitized almost 1,500 UPK titles, which we're working with Mary Beth and Adrian to make available on UK knowledge. So we're committed to open access. Um, the, the, the last two things I want to get across. One, um, several proponents of open access have recently said that uh, um, that, you know, they, they have issues with the authority exerted by university presses. Why do we get to be the gatekeepers? And uh, this book by Kathleen Fitzgerald, she praises bloggers for, quote, decentralizing and displacing the authority structures surrounding traditional journalism. Okay. She celebrates that. I would say you know, decide for yourself if blogging has been good for journalism. And tell me if I'm overwrought thinking that open access may cause similar problems for scholarship. Um, let's see, I'll get to the, I'll get to the meat of it. Um, open access presents huge opportunities, but we, we're cautious at university presses about diving in with both feet because we're skeptical about the commitment to excellence. Okay? You know, I hate to break it to people, but not all scholarship is equal. Okay? Not everything deserves to be published. Um, it's, it's, it, it's, uh, someone once said, you know, trying to get information off the internet is trying to is like trying to get a sip of water from a fire hydrant okay we 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 read we improve um and we disseminate what we think is the best scholarship and we do it without regard for sales um finally um i think there's a larger cultural problem and it, it concerns all of us involved in the scholarly enterprise and, and i mean students teachers, publishers, authors, um, librarians, okay? We're having trouble sustaining a literate culture, okay? And, and, and I, I'm gonna just read a quote, um, and it's from Christopher Lash in his 1996 book called The Revolt of the Elites. And he writes, the market notoriously tends to universalize itself. It does not easily coexist with institutions that operate according to principles antithetical to itself. Schools and universities, newspapers and magazines, charities and families. Sooner or later, the market tends to absorb them all. It puts an almost irresistible pressure on every activity to justify itself in the only terms it recognizes, to become a business proposition to pay its own way, to show black ink on the bottom line. It turns news into entertainment, scholarship into professional careerism, social work into the scientific management of poverty. Inexorably, the market remodels every institution in its own image. And I would just end with this question for all of us. What is the value of an educated student? What is the value of an informed citizen? How much is it worth? Thank you.